As the circus of the 2016 presidential election grinds on, Hillary Clinton has posited herself as the candidate of the people. But not many candidates of the people have vacation homes in the Hamptons that cost $200,000 per month or hang out with the world's billionaires. You know, it's hard to know who she really is. While once being a proponent of Donald Trump-type positions like building a wall at the Mexican border, supporting torture and opposing same-sex marriage until 2013, Today, Hillary Clinton presents herself as the anti-Trump, anti-Republican candidate. There's been a lot of outrage about the impression that the establishment has already anointed her as the Democratic nominee and has carved out her path to the presidency. But like in 2008, her guaranteed seat on the throne is being derailed by the unpredictable moods of the masses and millions of young progressive voters. She continues to play her shape-shifting game, morphing her positions to try to capture the support from her opponent. But the real Hillary is still inside. In fact, every layer of Hillary's career shows why. Far from being a candidate of the people, she's the top pick by corporations to do the real job of any U.S. president, be the CEO of the empire. And they're working hard to keep her on that path to the throne. Having been party insiders for decades, the Clintons have manipulated DC reporters, mastered the media spin, and have a well-oiled PR machine at their beck and call. Hillary Clinton has done everything right. She has run a good campaign. She has uh, outperformed in debates. She's raised money. She's got a great gr ground game. As a Latina, I can tell you that Latinos all over the country are very excited about Hillary. Latina women are very excited about Hillary. I knew from the beginning that when the conversation turned to foreign policy, that this was going to be when Hillary Clinton really shined. And I think that that whole exchange was probably one of her strongest moments of the night. Undisclosed is that many of the people praising Hillary across the corporate media work at firms employed by Clinton's campaign in super PACs. It's not just paid pundits, but the reporters and owners themselves. From Chris Matthews to the head of the New York Times, a big gang of media personalities have financial and personal ties to the Clintons. But even with Citizens United and unfettered corporate funding, the establishment can't prevent an insurgent candidate like Bernie Sanders from winning with votes. Which is why back in 1984, the Democratic Party created a superdelegate process to further undermine democracy. Here's how it works. There's about 4,000 pledged delegates divided by primary and caucus results. But there's an additional 700 superdelegates that remain unpledged, meaning they can vote against the people's will to ensure nominees are hand-picked party insiders. The single vote of a superdelegate is worth thousands of ours. Many of these people are current and former members of Congress, but dozens more are literally corporate lobbyists, working on behalf of every industry from healthcare to private prisons. Like superdelegate Tony Burgos, Pfizer lobbyist and Clinton fundraiser. Or superdelegates Jill Alper, Minion Moore, and Maria Cardona at Dewey Square Group, a lobbying firm that works directly with the Clinton campaign and lobbied on behalf of healthcare corporations to craft Obamacare for their benefit. Then there's superdelegate Jeff Berman, top lobbyist at Brian Cave, and former lobbyist for the Keystone XL Pipeline and Geo Group private prisons. Berman is even paid by the Clintons to round up other superdelegate votes. This unelected nobility comprises one-third of all delegates needed to secure the Democratic nomination. And the Clintons are surrounded by a flock of Democratic Party politicians who know the career benefits of hitching their wagon to the most powerful family in Washington. And with bills cajoling, Hillary had at least 500 superdelegate pledges under her belt months before the election had even begun, a 45 to 1 delegate lead over Sanders. This insane Democratic inversion plays out every time Sanders crushes a state, like in Wyoming, where he won by double digits but walked away with the same number of delegates. It's not just superdelegates investing in Hillary. Every arm of the corporatocracy has been hedging their bets on her for almost two decades. Alongside media conglomerates Cablevision and Time Warner, five of Hillary's top 10 political donors since 1999 have been some of the most powerful banks, 
Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, and Lehman Brothers. But those numbers pale in comparison to how much Wall Street firms have graciously donated to Hillary's super PAC, to the tune of $15 million. Beyond banks, every industry has been buying into another Clinton presidency. Lobbying groups for private prison giants Geo Group and Corrections Corporation of America are bundling dollars to the Ready for Hillary PAC. Hillary's also been given more money from Big Pharma than any other candidate and received over a third of total contributions given out by pharmaceutical giants. The defense industry thinks she's good for business too. Defense contractor employees have given her more cash than any other candidate. Fossil fuel lobbyists are also working hard to elect Hillary. Her 2016 campaign received more than four and a half million dollars from lobbyists, bundlers, and donors connected to the world's biggest polluters. Their investment will pay off tenfold. Hillary has been at the forefront of promoting fracking, a dangerous and destructive method of natural gas extraction. And she's much more than just a supporter of fracking. She personally created a bureau at the State Department focused on spreading it around the world with one of her major sponsors, Chevron. The Clintons sell their friendship through other avenues, such as huge honorariums for speaking fees. Much like George W. Bush's motivational speaking tour, Bill and Hillary are quick to exploit themselves for corporate loot, but they don't come cheap. Averaging $211,000 a pop, Bill and Hillary made more than $153 million in paid speeches to elite think tanks and closed door boardrooms since 2001. In 2013, the year after leaving the State Department, Hillary made $3 million giving just 12 speeches to Wall Street banks and financial institutions. This calculates to her earning $5,000 per minute. Seems like good honest work to me. Demands to release the speech transcripts have been laughed off by Hillary. But we don't really need to see the transcripts because we already know what's in them. Her praising banks and committing to their prosperity. Although Hillary has recently tried to appear critical of Wall Street to pander to Sanders' immense support, her fat cat banker donors aren't worried in the slightest, saying her talking points about inequality are, quote, just politics. But how did Hillary Clinton become such a political force that the empire's biggest powerhouses and establishment elites flock to her with money and support? Hillary was born in 1947 to a wealthy textile wholesaler who unsuccessfully ran for public office. She has two brothers, one a failed businessman, the other a failed politician. Both have their own history of public scandals. Hillary's first political work was campaigning for the Donald Trump of the 60s, far-right Republican Barry Goldwater. Hillary maintains that she was proud to be a Goldwater girl and writes off her support for the offensive character as just youthful ignorance. But the timing tells a different story. This was in 1964, when the Civil Rights Act was passed. After the Freedom Rides, after MLK's I Have a Dream speech at the historic March on Washington, Goldwater's campaign was an open reaction to that. Later, Hillary became president of the Young Republicans Club at her elite university. She says she later transformed, which is a common thing for Hillary, but her conservative past is more tied to her rise than she wants you to know. The Clintons' climb to prominence had everything to do with the political climate in the country. During the civil rights period, the Republican Party emerged as the new choice for racist whites. Reagan's sweeping victories in the South, ushering in 12 years of Republican administrations, put the Democratic Party in a panic. A younger movement within the party formed to win back the Southern vote, known as the New Democrats. And it did so through a conservative shift, canceling out hallmark great society economic policies and appealing to anti-black attitudes by distancing themselves from prominent black Democrats, targeting mythical welfare queens and pushing so-called criminal reforms that targeted African Americans. There are a new generation of Democrats, Bill Clinton and Al Gore, and they don't think the way the old Democratic Party did. They've called for an end to welfare as we know it, so welfare can be a second chance, not a way of life. They've sent a strong signal to criminals by supporting the death penalty. Bill swept the Southern white vote on his ending welfare as we know it and tough on crime coded racism. We're making some progress. Much of it is related to the initiative called community policing because we have finally gotten more police officers on the street. That was one of the goals that the president had when he pushed the crime bill that was passed in 1994. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heel. 
Hillary Clinton tries to rationalize her support for these measures today as having unintended consequences, but they were precisely designed to target African Americans. At the helm of a right turn for the party, politicians flocked to the Clintons, which brought a new era of Democratic Party politics, adapting to the changing needs of empire. Neoliberalism was enacted through NAFTA, decimating American jobs and economies abroad. Massive deregulation of Wall Street and the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act set the stage for an economic crisis. Clinton's crime bill exploded our shameful era of mass incarceration. When the Clintons left the White House in 1999, their rise to political powerhouses was really just the beginning, despite Bill's numerous sexual harassment cases. With the plan to put Hillary in the Oval Office next, they moved to their new home state of New York, where Hillary became a senator the following year. While wealthy, the Clintons had nowhere near the money they have today. On their 1999 tax returns, they made less than $500,000. But by 2014, they were making more than 50 times that amount, reporting over $28 million in income. And that only scratches the surface of the cash supplies they've amassed. While Hillary went to work crafting a presidential resume in the Senate, Bill capitalized on his new super elite status as a former president. And the Clintons' way of cashing in on that access was by exploiting misery and disaster. In 2001, in response to a major earthquake in India, the Clintons joined the heads of Goldman Sachs and Citibank and embarked on a false philanthropy model that would define their Clinton Foundation. These development and relief charities act as an insertion needle for Western business. For example, some of the Clinton Foundation's so-called development projects in India, Africa, and Central America include forming for-profit farming corporations that exploit small farmers. The donations typically end up back in the pockets of donors, their companies getting the so-called development contracts to build up mobile networks and real estate. In the past 15 years, the Clinton Foundation has grown into a lucrative fraternity of the rich and powerful, which boasts of having projects in 180 different countries. Including its numerous spin-off affiliates, it reported total assets of over $351 million in 2013. The sources of cash for this political machine say everything about the true nature of this charity. As a nonprofit, the Clinton Foundation is not required to disclose donors or contributions. All of the funds disclosed on the website are in ranges and unspecified for what purpose. Other than a $25 million partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Clinton Foundation's large donor base is a motley crew of criminal corporations and police state monarchies. Giving a gracious $10 million is the brutal theocratic kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Matching the $10 million is the Victor Pinchuk Foundation, Ukrainian billionaire oligarch who pledged tens of millions more to the Clinton Global Initiative to quote, modernize Ukraine while Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. Donating in the $1 to $5 million range are Gulf state monarchies Oman, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar and Kuwait, Saudi billionaire Nasir al-Rashid, ExxonMobil, Dow Chemical, Walmart, a company she has close ties to having served on their board of directors from 1986 to 1992, Coca-Cola, Pfizer, Barclays Capital, Goldman Sachs, and Boeing, the number two defense contractor in the country. In the lower million dollar range are such exemplary institutions as Monsanto, Chevron, General Electric, more banks, Bank of America, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, UBS, Bank of California, and media giant Fox's News Corp. Then there's the Soros Foundation, an organization that claims to build, quote, tolerant democracies around the world, whatever that means. It's a win-win relationship, one that only continues to grow. The Clintons get massive financial support to run their machine, and their contributors get the perks of a loyal advocate in a position of power. As Hillary ascends off of this corporate sponsorship, the more favors she can grant, leading to more contributions, and so on. And while Hillary was in the Senate, these favors for her donors were numerous. Manufacturing giant known as Corning gave hundreds of thousands to the Clintons through their foundation and speaking fees. In return, Hillary introduced Senate legislation to allot hundreds of millions in federal aid to purchase Corning products. Notorious criminal enterprises Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae were also Clinton Foundation sponsors who won big by investing in Senator Clinton. She played a key role in blocking measures to regulate them, helping them reap super profits before facilitating the crash of the economy. The deal was good for business while Hillary was in the Senate, but the plan was always something bigger. After checking the box of having experience and having built a robust financial backing and political network, Hillary announced her bid for president in 2006 shortly after her Senate re-election. She was supposed to be the shoe-in. It was her time, as they said. 
But then everything blew up in her face. Mass opposition to the Iraq war marginalized her as a candidate. A little known Barack Obama was flung to the front for his rhetoric against the war, while Hillary ardently defended her vote for the war throughout her entire campaign. Knocked off a presumed ride to the White House, she flailed trying to capture a changing Democratic Party base. Her campaign was criticized for its slew of dirty tricks, including an array of voter suppression tactics mainly aimed at the youth. Most pathetic was the release of a photo of Obama in a turban, pandering to Islamophobia and the strategy of thinly veiled racism the Clintons employed back in the 90s. Obama's campaign manager, David Plouffe, said the photo was the most shameful, offensive fear-mongering we've seen from either party in this election. But none of the schemes worked. And while today Hillary's media surrogates continue to call on close competitor Bernie Sanders to drop out, back in 2008 she held out to the very bitter end, refusing to give in when Obama was the clear winner. She only acquiesced and backed Obama after a closed-door negotiation where she was promised a promotion and a path to succeed him. As Secretary of State, the rewards for her sponsors grew to a new level, and so too did donations to the Clintons. Her corruption is exemplified by the fact that 181 donors to the Clinton Foundation simultaneously lobbied the State Department while she was in charge. She used her position to divvy out repayment favors in a variety of ways. She funneled money from the State Department to Clinton friends and sponsors, like securing tens of millions in government grants for her dear friend and owner of for-profit education firm, Lorette Education, Inc. She also used her new title to help negotiate business deals between her donor friends and other heads of state. For example, she brought billionaire mining magnate Frank Giostra to meet the president of Colombia, scoring him access to pristine forests and coastline to be mined and drilled by his company. She did the same in Kazakhstan and beyond. Hillary convinced other countries to give up permits to be pillaged. In one incident, she convinced the Haitian government to issue a rare mining permit. The contract went out to a mining company that not only shells out millions to the Clinton Foundation, but her brother sits on its board of directors. She also flew around the world on the taxpayer's dime to act as a saleswoman for American corporations. For her sponsor Boeing, she made a personal pitch to the Russian government to purchase their jets. The result was a $3.7 billion contract for Boeing. The Clintons got a kickback of 900 k as a giant thank you from the war profiteer. But none of these deals compare to her role as an international arms dealer. Her State Department approved a whopping $165 billion worth of commercial arms sales to 20 nations that are also Clinton Foundation sponsors, doubling U.S. arms sales to those countries under George W. Bush. These lucrative deals are undeniably rewards for paying off the Clintons. The amount of the reward directly corresponded to the amount of their donation. Her top donor, Saudi Arabia, scored the biggest, and so on down the line. Beyond the obvious step up from her corporate shilling as Senator and Secretary of State, wreaking economic and environmental havoc to line the pockets of Clinton coffers, a President Hillary puts us in great danger of catastrophic war, another fact she's proven time and again over the entirety of her career. Clinton's war record is perhaps most exemplified by her endorsement from one of the world's most notorious war criminals, the butcher of Cambodia, Henry Kissinger. On the campaign trail, she bragged, I was very flattered when Henry Kissinger said I ran the State Department better than anybody had run it in a long time. So I have an idea about what it's going to take to make our government work more efficiently. Yes, the relationship between Kissinger and Clinton is very close. Not only did she consult with him regularly as Secretary of State, her and Bill frequently vacationed with the Kissingers. Her other foreign policy advisors are quite similar, including PNAC founder neoconservative Robert Kagan, and even shares advisors with Republican war hawks like Ted Cruz. Her support for the criminal invasion of Iraq has come back to haunt her once again in this election, and now she's written it off as a mistake, and in one instance seemed to blame it on being bribed by George Bush with state funds for New York. So I'm sitting there in the Oval Office, and Bush says to me, what do you need? I said, I need $20 billion to rebuild, yeah. you know, New York. He said, you got it. And he was good to his word. But she didn't just vote for the war. She was a key advocate of it, leading a right-wing minority among Democratic Party Congress members that favored the invasion over the old tactics of empire's domination. She called for, quote, unequivocal support for Bush's firm leadership and decisive action. She spread the lie that Iraq was in violation of UN resolutions, despite the actual weapons inspectors arguing the contrary, and continued to assert Iraq had WMDs despite it being, by that time, thoroughly debunked. 
As the US and Iraqi body count grew and complete disaster ensued, Hillary still went around the country asserting that she had no regrets giving Bush total authority to invade and occupy Iraq. In 2007, she voted to give Bush the same authority again, with a blank check to attack Iran by trying to label their military a terrorist organization, a move rejected even by pro-war Democrats. Today, Joe Lieberman, who authored the Iraq Resolution, has authored another resolution, and it is essentially a fig leaf to let George Bush go to war with Iran. And I want to congratulate Biden for voting against it, Dodd for voting against it, and I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. You're not going to get another shot at this, because what's happened, if this war ensues, we invade and they're looking for an excuse to do it. And Obama was not even there to vote. Senator Clinton, I want to give you a chance to respond. <laughs> In 2008, Senator Clinton made the chilling and completely repulsive admission that if president, she would not rule out using nuclear weapons on Afghanistan and Pakistan. After her promotion to Secretary of State, she boldly planted a flag in the Obama administration to establish the Hillary Doctrine. According to The Nation, two dozen current and former administration officials, foreign diplomats, friends and outside analysts described Mrs. Clinton as almost always the advocate of the most aggressive actions considered by Mr. Obama's national security team. Of course, she joined Obama in creating and leading terrible fronts to human life and rights, like the murderous drone campaign in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. The program's mass civilian casualties, she says, she takes with a grain of salt. However, on other issues, she took the lead, showing how she would steer the empire's ship as she aimed for the presidency. In her book, she brags about her lead role back in the 2009 coup of the democratically elected leader in Honduras, further plunging the country into violence and instability. Also that year, when it was long clear that the Afghanistan war was an endless, unwinnable crisis, she lobbied to send far more troops in Obama's blood-soaked troop surge. When it was time to keep the promise of bringing those troops home, then Secretary of Defense Robert Gates says that Hillary argued forcefully against withdrawing the surge troops. She continues to advocate a never-ending U.S. occupation there. The same thing happened when it came to Iraq. Hillary led a minority that tried to convince Obama to leave thousands more American combat troops there, permanently. Today, she's to the right of Obama on Iraq yet again, advocating for even more U.S. troops more combat. Then came what has been dubbed Hillary's War, a move Obama recently admitted was his biggest mistake. Oil-rich Libya is where Clinton sought to showcase her military doctrine, masked and sinister right to protect jargon. Hillary is well known as the primary advocate for U.S.-led attack to overthrow the Libyan state, to feed on its resources and hijack the Arab Spring. As we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> She laughed about an African leader being lynched on television. His country tossed into an era of unimaginable pain. Right afterward, what everyone predicted happened. Strife from a shattered state, decimated infrastructure, and U.S. armed rebel fighters has turned Libya into a new bastion for ISIS. The scandal of Benghazi isn't that Hillary allowed Americans to die, but that those Americans were there funneling weapons to extremists in a country she had just helped destroy. And what did Hillary take away from the incident? That there should have been more American troops. We have learned the hard way. When America is absent, especially from unstable places, there are consequences. Yeah, I don't think it was because America was absent, but because they had just carpet bombed the country and injected its entire government. And on Syria, she's led the push for war from the beginning. She personally joined the shame general, David Petraeus, in creating the CIA-led Friends of Syria insurgency. She was among the first and most forceful in pushing for a no-fly zone to overthrow the Syrian state. Even as recently as 2015, she had a high-profile break with Obama over the issue, and even in recent debates had to continue to advocate for it. A no-fly zone means war. It means U.S. bombing of all Syrian anti-aircraft defense systems and much more it would undoubtedly trigger a broader regional conflict involving nuclear powers. When it comes to Israel, she has rebuked Obama on the most mild criticisms of Israeli war crimes and vows to give the occupation more aid than any other candidate. But the biggest apparent danger of a regime under the Hillary Doctrine is the risk of new U.S. wars. If Hillary was a proud leader of what's accepted as the biggest foreign policy catastrophes of both the Bush and Obama administrations, 
What else should be expected of a Hillary administration? Well, one little discussed threat posed by a Hillary presidency is that she spent her time in office paving the way for war with Iran. When asked in a recent Democratic debate what enemy she was most proud to have, she answered, the Iranians. In the 2008 campaign, she was ostracized for her aggressive comments about Iran. They might be in their nuclear weapons program in the next 10 years, during which they might foolishly consider launching an attack on Israel. We would be able to totally obliterate them. She's always advocated the most hawkish approaches to Iran. But in recent years, she's made a point to separate herself from Obama as the more strong arm than the sly war by sanctions and subversion. With the signing of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, Obama was staunch in refusing to threaten Iran with a military attack if they violated the agreement. However, Hillary went over his head to show her sword was sharper, declaring her position on television. We will not hesitate to take military action if Iran attempts to obtain a nuclear weapon. Given her proud support for a war of aggression for non-existent WMDs in Iraq, no one should trust her standards. Nobody doubts that a U.S. war with Iran would likely be catastrophic and wider reaching than the Iraq war. This great danger facing the lives of countless people around the world should never be understated. But it's not just Iran. In every part of the world from Latin America to Asia, Hillary Clinton has made clear that she will choose the path of death and destruction every time no matter the consequences. We know they're gonna use fear of the Republican nominee to pressure everyone into supporting her. They don't want us to know that we can and we should fight both sides. And as a woman, I completely reject Hillary's brand of bourgeois feminism because it leaves out millions of immigrant women, poor women, and the women under her bombs around the world.